Well, I'm excited to be here with everybody and see your smiling faces. We're going to take a little bit of time together um, to talk about really some basics. And I'm happy to stop and answer any questions as we go forward. Um, we'll also have a time at the end. I'm going to be sharing a PowerPoint. And if we want to make that available, if anybody wants it, they're welcome to have it. Um, just helpful for all of us to you know, know where we're going and what we're talking about. So essentially, um, I basically help people answer three questions. Um, the first question I help people answer is, what happens if you die? Where's your stuff supposed to go? Who's supposed to get it? How can they get it in the most task advantage manner possible? Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today. And the second question I help people answer every day when I'm at work is, what happens if you don't die? What happens if you get sick? What do we need to do today to protect your spouse from the cost of long-term care, to protect any child that you have with special needs, um, to make sure that we can protect some of what you have? And the third question, which you know, I've added in the last five or six years, is what happens if you don't, get, don't just get sick, but you get dementia or Alzheimer's? And what is it that we need to do to get ready for that? So, you know, as Peter said, you know, I come with a social work background and I definitely bring that to the practice of law, um, particularly today in society as um, other larger institutions aren't able to help us connect the dots. Um, we wanna really make sure that we are, we are prepared, we have a plan in place and we can help with that. So I'm just gonna share my screen. Um, And I apologize if it takes me a little bit to transition. I usually have two screens, but my internet was not working all that well at my house today. So I'm downstairs at, downstairs at my dining room table. So um, just with one screen. But as I said, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about the basics. Um, and we're gonna spend a lot of time on, you know, some very basic documents, but that's because I think it's so important. Um, what we really wanna think about is a foundation. So we build a house, you know, we know we need a really good foundation. Um, and so we'll talk about, um, maybe some of you already have done some of this and what are good times to get it updated or what are specific questions um, that if you go back to your attorney um, that you should be asking them. I'm going to kind of go through this. I think Peter's introduction was um, difficult to listen to. <laughs> Very long, um, but um, we do have offices both in Williamsport and State College. I personally live in between um, outside of Jersey Shore, Pennsylvania. Um, I practiced law for 20 years in um, Williamsport and Amos Goodall, who practiced law for many years in State College, when he decided that it was time for him to slow down and retire, he approached me and asked me if I would take over his law firm. And that's what happened about four or five years ago. Amos still does practice at our law firm, um, but he doesn't have to worry about the day-to-day -day management, you know, what staff's there, what staff isn't, um, or all these COVID restrictions that we're going through. Um, so. Um, as Peter mentioned, I am the author of many books and really fundamentally, um, I believe my job is to help educate um, people about what their choices are um, so that they then can make the best choice in line with their goals for their family. Um, at the end, we'll talk about, you know, if any of you want copies of these books, we're happy to give them to you. Um, we will have a thing if you want um, any of them you can just ask us and actually Kyle will uh, mail them out to you. Uh, so I will give a special, you know, thought about the Alzheimer's and dementia books. Um, you know, it is a disease that's, that's really difficult, um, both for the person that's going through it and the family. Um, and it's something that we have to be more keen to um, making sure we have a good plan in place. So you know, I wanna think about, you know, why are we here? It's Saturday morning. Um, some of us could be sleeping in. Um, I'm an early bird. I, I wish I had the ability to sleep in, but I kind of get up no matter what. Um, but um, what we want to think about is like, why would, why do you even take the time to think about these things? Because, you know, I told you the questions that I answered and they're not that exciting. Nobody's really excited to say, oh, this is what's going to happen when I die. Um, or this is what's going to happen if I get sick. 
Um, but really, you know, fundamentally, we want to protect. Um, and I think that to me, that's like a really important word because we take this, um, we take these steps to protect. Um, provide for whoever is within your family, whether that's you yourself um, and you don't have a lot of extended family, really important that we have decision makers and we know who to talk to or your spouse or children, grandchildren. Maybe you have somebody in your family who has a special need. Uh, maybe you have somebody who has, um, you know, autism that's going to affect their ability later on to be able to support themselves and maybe they will need benefits and what do we need to do about that? Um, maybe some of you are on here because you're worried about your own parents. Um, you know, just this week, my father-in-law passed away after dealing with dementia for 14 years and going through the thick of that process reminds me why all of us, all of us should go out and pre-plan our funerals. <laughs> pick out the songs that we want, um, you know, uh, so, um, but, you know, we're here today because we know it's going to happen to us and we want to provide or protect for ourselves. For some of us, we might even have other issues. We might, you know, feel like we have a hard-earned assets. So we want to make sure who they get to and um, who they don't get to. Uh, so interestingly, one of the things I, I hear most often from my clients is that they have lovely children. It's the in-laws that are the problem. Um, and, you know, that could be, you know, your family. And that's certainly something we can talk about. Um, we also really want to be concerned about family businesses. Um, I'm very proud of the fact that I have done succession plans for family businesses and they have successfully made it to the next generation. And um, that's where we really need to slow down and talk about things because sometimes the generation that that has run that business holds on to it so much and doesn't let the younger generation in to make decisions. And then when they pass away, it's hard. It's just a hard transition. So how can we help with that? We certainly do deal with gas royalties. Um, that's not as big of an issue in the State College area as it is in the Williamsport area. Um, but I want you to think today about being here to, for protection both during your life um, if you were to get sick and also after your death. <clears throat> we're going to talk about issues about control, uh, who gets to be the decision maker, um, who is it that we want to um, be in charge of that, and what's the timing? Um, you know, one statistic I often share with my clients is that if you, um, if you pass away for some of your children, it's like hitting the lottery. Now, please know, I don't mean that they wouldn't be very sad about your passing, but they may inherit an amount of money that they're not used to dealing with. And there's a statistic I, that always sticks with me, and it never has changed in my career. Um, and that is that 85% of people who hit the lottery are worse off financially two years later. And please know, I've done this for 20 years, and I've sat on the other side of the table, and I've watched what children do with inheritances. Um, and what you have to ask yourself is, is the amount of money they're going to receive something they're used to? Is it something that they will know what to do? Or is it something that you should start having conversations today about? Um, and thinking, please know that's all your choice. But for me, you know, waste is waste. Um, you know, interestingly, and I don't usually share this, um, but I will tell you one of the basic tenants I grew up with with my mom is that wasting is a sin. Um, don't overeat, don't over drink, don't over, you know, that was, that was ba a basic tenet. Um, and so if you think about that from, um, from this perspective, what a waste it is to have this hard earned money and then give it to kids who aren't prepared to know what to do with it and maybe get taken advantage of um, by scammers or out there. The other reason we do it is just clarity. Please know, unfortunately in my career, I spent years being court appointed um, in situations where people, uh, people were fighting. And um, what, what I know in all of those situations is that often both sides really thought they were right. And there was a lack of clarity about what their parent who had deceased wanted. Um, so at my office, we try to be very clear. Not only do we have you write down the documents, we also have a written plan 
uh, that we send to your CPA, your financial advisor, because we want clarity. And that's something, you know, again, I'm here today to help you in any way. You're very welcome to take what I say and talk to your attorney if you've already been to an attorney about it. I'm going to try to go through and talk about things like when would things need updated. But I think clarity is really important. And I'd encourage all of you, if you have an estate plan done, go back to the attorney that did it and ask them to tell you what it says. Um, I can't tell you how many times in a review appointment where I thought I did a really good job and it's three years later and somebody calls me and says, you know, for whatever reason, we want to review it. You know, maybe somebody passed away or there's a divorce. We kind of we go over what they did and um, they're not sure that that's what they wanted. And, um, you know, it's really important. I don't think you can think of doing an estate plan as a once and done type of thing. And that's because law, laws change, which I'm going to talk about today, but also you change and your family changes. Um, I'll share with you all. Um, the number one reason that people come to my office to update their estate plan, I don't know if any of you have a guess, but just think in your head, why would somebody come back to me after doing an estate plan? Number one reason, we track this stuff at our office. We tracked this years ago. Number one reason is that they've decided that they like their grandchildren better than their children. Uh, <laughs> so when I often when people come in to update, they start asking me, well, can I give money to my grandchildren? Um, and that's a, something that's always stuck with me because actually it's what happened in my family. My mom, who is still alive, she at some point in time decided that this money should go to her grandchildren and not to my brother and I. And I'm fine with that. I mean, it's her choice. Um, the other thing is that sometimes, you know, and here's a clarity thing, sometimes people have um, grandchildren that are, you know, a wide variety of ages. Uh, like in my mom's situation, my oldest daughter is 24, um, but there's still kids that are like 16. That's not a huge span. Um, but my mom helped my oldest daughter um, through college. Not really a big deal, but whenever she would come home, she'd give her $50 or $100. Well, what happens, and some people help with the tuition. Well, what happens if my mom were to pass away and we still have my niece, Lexi, who's 16? Shouldn't she get that same stuff that um, my oldest daughter, Courtney, got? And that's where some clarity comes in, uh, particularly if you start making large gifts um, to help with tuition. Is that something that we should address in your estate plan? Because would you want to continue that for the rest of the kids? Please know I'm not on here telling you that you have to. This is your choice. My job is to kind of help you think about things that maybe we don't think about. Because um, naturally, you may not think about, well, what happens if I die before that last grandchild? Or you might make assumptions um, that your kids will know what to do. Um, and they may have different views of what was the right thing to do in that situation. So. And for all of it's peace of mind, um, peace of mind for you. But also if you're gonna rely on a child or a family member to help you, um, peace of mind for them to know that if they have to act, that they have the power to act um, and they know what they're doing. Um, so many times I'll be honest with you, I work with kids after they're in a tough situation like deciding whether or not um, to pull the plug, to turn off artificial. And what kids really struggle with is, did they do what their parent wanted? If we all come to this conversation with the thought that our children are going to try to do the best that they possibly can, um, but what we don't want them to do is to worry about it later. Did I do what my mom or my dad wanted or my loved one? Could be an aunt, an uncle. Um, so that's what we want. We want peace of mind. So where do we start? So if we say that we want protection, clarity, and peace of mind, where do we start? Well, I'm an attorney, so we're going to talk about documents. Um, uh, so, um, you know, good legal documents. Uh, we're going to talk about powers of attorneys. We're going to actually talk pretty in depth about them. Um, they are the simplest documents, but they're actually the most important. And if we go back to thinking about that foundation, um, if I'm in a crisis situation and I have a good power of attorney, I can do a lot with that. If I don't, I have to wait on the court systems. So we're going to talk about that. And please know, 
Um, powers of attorneys are really important for people of any age, um, from uh, 18 over. Um, so, you know, I have three kids, two of them are over the age of 18. Um, for their 18th birthday, they got powers of attorneys. Yes, it is exciting to live in my household. Um, that's what you now know. Uh, <laughs> but very important, um, particularly this year um, with kids and grandkids going away to college um, and wondering what, what may happen with COVID. Um, one of the things that my law office did in response to that is we actually on our website have a free healthcare power of attorney that people can download. Um, that is not as good as coming to our office or going to any law office and, and dealing with all of it. But if you have a grandchild who's 18 or a child who's over 18 and they don't have any of these documents, it's a really good place to start. You just get on our website, they can download it for free um, and they can um, you know, be able to deal with that. We're also gonna talk about wills and trusts. And so a big question that I get from many people is, should I have a will or should I have a trust? And the answer to that is that you know, a simple will works for many people. Um, we use trusts in situations where we're gonna establish a goal. Um, and so we'll talk about those goals later on. Okay, why else? Well, it's nice to have organization. Uh, you know, I can't tell you how difficult it is when we work with estates where maybe the, you know, somebody's passed away, but they didn't work with our office and we don't even know what their assets are. I have a case right now where a man who I just adored actually went on three mission trips with him to Honduras. Um, but he didn't have a lot of organization and um, he passed away and we couldn't find his original will and it was really hard. I had to go to court three times and in a situation where honestly the family's not fighting. Um, they're not overly involved, but they're not fighting um, and so we want some organization. Also beneficiary designations and I'll talk more about this later, but no matter what you do after having this conversation today, something that every one of us can do very simply without even having to go to an attorney is just making sure all of our beneficiaries are up to date. So um, as a general rule, you never want your estate as your beneficiary. And you do want to check to make sure that the company that you're working with um, has the right beneficiaries. This is particularly true of like life insurance. Um, interestingly, just this week, a good friend of mine who we did her estate plan, we changed her beneficiaries. Um, but part of what happens, remember, is like all of us understand that these companies are bought and sold. So like your life insurance might be owned by a different company than it was 10 years ago, or your IRA might be administered by a different company. Well, please know, not always when those new companies buy it, do the beneficiary designations go along with it. So it's a really important thing for all of us. Now, when we work with clients, we actually do this for them, but it's also something you can do yourself. Call your life insurance company um, and say, I wanna know, I want a list of who my beneficiaries are. As just a general rule, named people are the best um, for that. But like in my, my friend's situation, her ex-husband was listed as her beneficiary. Now we know we changed that, I have the paperwork in my file, um, but the company was brought out. Um, she's actually retired, but she was a financial advisor during her life and she knew that could happen. And so she checked on it. Um, so that sounds a little crazy, I know, but I can give you at least three examples of my office um, where that's happened. And I can give you one example where the person had actually passed away. The money got paid out to the wrong person, but I had proof in my file of where it was supposed to go. Now. We never want that situation because nobody's happy to give back money. Um, and so we want to think about it. Most importantly, we want a comprehensive plan. So we want to um, get our financial advisor and our accountant to talk to our attorney if it's necessary, you know, particularly if you own a business or if we're going to do something. Never allow yourself to be in a situation where your attorney says X and the financial advisor says why, and they won't talk to each other. Because usually they're both right, 
They just have different goals. So I, as an attorney, my goal is to protect you. Um, I, I spent a lot of my life trying to figure out how to protect you from, you know, lawsuits and slip and falls and all those types of things um, or getting sick. Um, a financial advisor, often their goal is to make your money grow. So I could tell you to do one thing and they could say, no, don't do that. And again, neither of us are right or wrong, but we might have different goals that are more important. And that's really your job to tell us what are the most important goals. And I'd urge you to be part of that conversation. Um, and again, you know, please know my goal today was to help you wherever you're at. If you already have an estate plan and a financial advisor, what I would do is suggest that they talk to each other, have a meeting jointly. And how easy is that now virtually? We all can Zoom together. Um, they don't have to drive to each other's offices um, and make sure that it's the best possible. I spend a good part of my days, um, you know, interacting with other professionals just to make sure that we together did the best job we could for our client um, and that we thought about everything. Okay, um, most important estate planning document, a power of attorney. It's simply a document that says, if I cannot talk for myself, so I'm still alive, but for whatever reason, I can't talk for, to myself, um, I appoint this other person to make those decisions. So for many of you, if you're married, you might appoint your spouse. Um, you don't always appoint your spouse, um, but many of you will. Um, if not, then you can appoint a child, children. Um, if you don't have any uh, children who can make good decisions, I suggest that you don't appoint any of your children, that you appoint somebody else. Um, you can, it can be somebody who's a friend, it can be a sibling, um, but it's something that we wanna think about quite a bit. So some of you, you know, a common misconception that I get often is that, well, can't my spouse just make decisions for me? Nope. With a divorce rate of over 60% uh, in, our, in our state and the average marriage lasting 11 years, the law does not assume that you like your spouse or that you want them making decisions for you. Um, so if that's what you want, we have to have a power of attorney that says that. Particularly difficult in um, second marriage situations because the law actually equates uh, a spouse and stepchildren, who would be the children of the person that's sick, equally. And the difficulty with that is that each person gets a vote. So in my situation, my mom was remarried and I had three stepbrothers and sisters, two stepsisters and one stepbrother. And in that situation, um, if my mom didn't have, if my stepdad hadn't given my mom power of attorney, when he got sick, they could have outvoted her. And that's unfortunate because they lived many miles away and my mom cared for him for many years. And when it finally got to the point in time that she had to consider putting him in a facility, um, they got very angry, even though they weren't around the last 10 years when my mom went through back surgery and did everything to help him. Um, so that, so just so you know, really important. The other part of this slide um, talks about, well, if I don't have a power of attorney. So let's say um, after this, um, I don't have a power of attorney and I'm driving down the road and I get in a car accident and I can't make um, any decisions. Um, one of the things that will happen is that I'll have to go get a guardianship. Now, please know, if I'm in a car accident and I'm taken to the hospital, they do everything they can to save my life. There's an ability for them to be able to do that um, without any decision makers. But this is later on. This is, you know, what facility, what rehab should I go to? What's my next course of action? Who's gonna advocate for me to get the best care? Um, if I don't have a power of attorney, we have to go get a guardianship. And guardianships, in, even in the best of situations, are time consuming and costly. So it takes about three months to get a guardianship, um, pre-COVID, to be honest with you. Um, during the time that we were shut down, um, there was places, there was, it was very different county by county. There was counties that we literally couldn't do anything. Now I will tell you, for those of you who live in Center County, um, that was a, um, 
shining star. Uh, their judicial system never missed a beat. Um, so those of you who live in that county, um, we, we would have been able to do something. Um, they, they never stopped probating estates. They immediately pivoted to virtual. So always good to find out something nice about where we live, right? <laughs> <clears throat> so I'm talking about powers of attorneys as if they're just, you know, one thing. Um, finance, but they, they really are four different documents. Um, so when I was a kid, I worked at my dad's law firm, and I remember going down the street to Plank and Horns, and it was a one-page sheet that I says, I give this person my power of attorney. Like in my situation, it would be like, I, Julie Steinbacher, give my husband Donald my power of attorney. And that was it. That's all you needed to do. Well, the legislature decided that maybe we didn't realize how much power we were giving to people. And the pendulum has swung completely to the opposite way, which means that in a power of attorney, if you want somebody to have that power, it has to say it in there. So a financial power of attorney is like 17 pages long. A healthcare is, you know, 15. A mental health power of attorney, which didn't even exist prior to 2013, in and of itself is, you know, 10 pages. Um, a living will can actually be a smaller document I um, mean, that law, actually the living will law in Pennsylvania hasn't changed since 1991. So that if you have one um, and you can get those free at the hospital, they're probably okay. So here's another thing. Like if you're on here today and you're like, well, I already have my estate plan done, um, please know, and we're gonna talk about the laws changing, but a very simple thing is to look at your power of attorney. And if it's only a couple pages or if it puts together financial and healthcare, very likely they need updated. Now again, you might want to go back to the law firm that originally did them because they might give you a discount on updating them. I don't know that. I know at my firm we do because part of, you know, when I first meet with somebody is opening a file and doing all of those things. If they're just coming back and updating it, that's a simpler thing to do. Um, so one of the things we want to think about. Um, so I kind of talked about this. Um, not all powers of attorneys are created equal. Uh, it, the older ones uh, definitely um, most likely need updated. Um, newer ones, though, um, depending on the law firm that you go to, some, particularly if you go to a general practice firm, they kind of think about powers of attorneys as a throwaway document. They're not, they don't get all that excited about it. See, I get very excited about my powers of attorneys. We are constantly adding new things because like financially, and remember that we deal with, with um, companies in every state. So in Pennsylvania, the law says I have to have certain wording, but I might be working with Merrill Lynch that is based more in New Jersey and they might want a different word. Well, really, I wanna put that wording in my power of attorney because I wanna make sure um, that um, it's easy to use. Um, I don't wanna get on the phone with a New Jersey attorney and explain to them Pennsylvania law and why that doesn't need to be in there. I'd rather just put it in um, so that we have an ease of being able to use it in that crisis situation. So the way I look at it is if a client cared enough to come to my office and do these things, you know, in a point like in my situation, if it wasn't my husband, it's my oldest daughter, Courtney. Um, I want her job to be as easy as possible. So part of why I want to get organized is because I don't want to leave a mess to my child to have to deal with. Um, this also gives you some thoughts, you know, if you have a financial power of attorney, the biggest thing I would look at is the gifting powers. So you see there, like the fourth one down, it says to make limited gifts. If your power of attorney says that, that really limits my power. Um, that means you can only make $15,000 gifts a year. Um, and please know there's lots of reasons why I want to make gifts bigger than that. Great example. If I have a husband and wife and husband goes into the nursing home, um, I may want to take the house out of both of their names and just put it in the name of the spouse that's still at home. Um, because if he, if he stays there, we use money to pay for his care and then he passes away and we lose a pension or a social security check, that spouse that's at home really needs that, um, really needs that house. Um, but if I don't have a power of attorney that allows me to make unlimited gifts, um, I'm not able to do that. And that's an odd case in Pennsylvania, um, but it's something we have to live by. 
Um, that case is called Metcalf. Not that any of you really care, but you know, it's exciting to me. Um, <laughs> But um, it's, it's kind of an outcome that people don't realize. So again, older ones that don't have complete power, but I, I have to be honest with you, I still see updated ones today coming through my office. It's one of the saddest things to tell a client who comes in and says, oh, I just got these updated. And then I look at them and they don't really have the power that I want. And please know, you know, you, you make your own decisions. Whenever you engage an attorney, you're going to engage some of their belief system you know, for me, I want to pick the best decision maker possible and give them all the power. I don't want to limit it because I know that I could then get in a crisis situation and need that power. And then I have to go get a guardianship anyways. Um, some attorneys will tell you, no, limit the power. Well, I bet you those attorneys don't do a lot of crisis work. See, 25% of what we do at our office every day is crisis that whatever is the horrible thing that you don't want to have happen just happened to that family. And we know that we want to be able to act quickly and efficiently. Um, so this talks about um, unlimited gifts, irrevocable trusts, um, which we do use irrevocable trusts. We'll talk about those later. Also, um, if you have a child who has special needs, we need to be able to deal with a special needs trust or to create that and that separate power that we need. Um, also, very exciting, Pennsylvania now has a, a law to deal with digital assets. Um, it took a long time for us to get that law, but we do now, um, and that's important. So what's a digital asset? It's like your password at your bank account or your Facebook um, you know, uh, login. Now, Facebook has something that you can give somebody else that login information. But I'll be honest with you, when I really um, got into the whole Facebook thing, my best friend's sister passed away and we couldn't get Facebook to take down her page. And that was horrible. It was horrible for the family. Um, so digital assets is, is any of these types of things that we deal with. Um, and we need to have a financial power of attorney that allows us to deal with that. Even if we're not gonna do a huge amount with it, just to keep away from fraud and scams, it's important, but also if you have out of town kids and they do have to pay bills or deal with the finances, what a wonderful thing for them to be able to do it online and virtually. You know, I think about earlier in my career when we had to fax everything or FedEx it, you know, and today we can just have instant access to information. It does make it easier for children who are out of town to be able to be helpful. So I talked about this, about the financial powers attorneys, about how the law changed. Um, it was actually in 2014. So again, something you can look if your power of attorney was done before 2014, it does need updated. Um, if it was done after, it shouldn't need updated. Um, but you know, I can't say that for sure without looking at it. <clears throat> um, and just so you know, the driving force behind this was really the banking industry. Um, not good or bad, but a bank accepted a power of attorney and it was not valid and the bank got sued. And the banking industry has a really good lobby and they lobbied for the law to change. So in the new powers of attorneys, if they accept um, an, uh, an invalid one, they're no longer liable. And that's why you see the banks wanting these newer power of attorneys. Um, so. Uh, again, um, I could argue with the banking attorney that it's valid and that they should accept it, but we never want to be in a crisis situation and have to get two attorneys to argue with each other, right? <laughs> that doesn't seem efficient. <laughs> so, <laughs> <clears throat> Healthcare powers of attorneys. Hold on one second. Okay, sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> there's somebody at my door. I apologize to you all. Um, but if we're for the healthcare power of attorney, again, you know, some of you, you might have a power of attorney that has just two sentences about healthcare. I assure you that healthcare is more exciting than that and more involved. We need a document um, that talks about who can make our decisions and what decisions is it that we want. Um, and so, Another big law there is HIPAA, which many of us know about, 
Well, I don't know how we can't. Every time we go someplace, they ask us who they can talk to. Uh, so they're HIPAA compliant. Well, our power of attorney also has to be HIPAA compliant. And the reason is because yes, your doctor's office, they might know in my situation that they can talk to my daughter or my husband. But if I'm in a car accident, I can be, you know, life flighted to Geisinger and Geisinger doesn't know that. They don't know who to talk to. And that's why I need to have a document that says, not only can these people make decisions, but they also can have access to my hospital records. Now, many of you might be thinking, well, that's common sense. If I want to make a decision, somebody to make a decision. So like in my situation, if I want my daughter to make a decision, I also want her to have access. The law is not common sense. Um, so <laughs> we actually have to say that, uh, so important. The mental health power of attorney, I'm gonna kind of go through this. Um, I think I've beaten the power of attorney uh, thing. Um, mental health um, did not used to be uh, a thing, um, but now it is, so we need a separate document. Um, the problem with these is they do expire every two years and we have to update them. Um, and so um, this is particularly true um, for anybody who has any sort of a mental health background, but I'll be honest with you, it's true for everybody because we don't know if we're gonna get dementia. We don't know if with an end stage cancer, if we're gonna have some mental health issues or if a loved one very important to us passes away, if that's gonna be hard for us to get through. Um, and deal with, so. Living wills, uh, living wills are documents that say um, at some point in time, it's okay not to um, aggressively treat me. Um, it's okay to pull the plug. So it can be anything from a use of a ventilator to oxygen to uh, um, food and water. Um, basically a living will comes into effect when we're no longer able to tell a doctor what we want and the doctor says, we're not gonna get any better. And that allows us to turn off the machine. Now, Pennsylvania is very different um, than the recent case that we saw out of Florida, um, uh, Terry Shivo, who in that case, they, um, they um, petitioned the court to turn off medical um, self-support. Support. Um, Pennsylvania, you actually couldn't do that. So in Pennsylvania, uh, in, in Florida, so it's called substituted judgment. So in that situation, they went to the judge and said, judge, please substitute your judgment, um, turn off this machine. Um, in Pennsylvania, the, the legal standard is very different. It's clear and convincing evidence. So the reason that we need a living will in Pennsylvania is that it's clear and convincing evidence that this person would not have wanted their life to go on. We can never substitute our judgment for another person. So very important to have. Although, um, actually a little useless in the actual situation because it doesn't exactly tell us what to do. We can't have a two page legal document that tells us what to do in the event of a car accident and stage Alzheimer's or, um, and so in those situations, I always suggest to um, my clients that you need to talk to your family. Um, all of these documents talk about a realistic hope of significant recovery. What does that mean to you? What is a realistic hope of significant recovery? And how has that changed across your lifespan? So I can give you an example. Um, my husband and I, a realistic hope of significant recovery is very different for us. Um, so I obviously make my, make my living talking, reading, writing. Um, and so a realistic, and I have children who are still under 18 that I'm you know, raising. For me, a realistic hope of significant recovery, I don't have to be able to move, I can be bedridden, but if I can interact at all with my son, who's still under 18, or, um, and I feel an obligation to raise, I want to be saved. I want them to do everything. When he gets older, I may feel different about that, um, but also realistic hope of significant recovery, it's okay with me if I'm um, not able to walk and do things. Um, my husband, he um, has owned a demolition and excavating company. He's right now on a backhoe. He's a guy that a realistic hope of significant recovery would mean he needs to be who he is. Um, and he would need to be able to walk around and do things. So having that information is actually helpful if I was ever to make a decision to say to a, uh, a doctor, what is, what is the outcome here? Um, and so, you know, again, we all have to make different decisions. 
but it also can change across the lifespan. Uh, maybe if you've dealt with a chronic decision, uh, a chronic disease for a long time and have been in a lot of pain, um, at some point in time, people say, you know, it's time to stop fighting. Uh, biggest thing here, hugest takeaway, is if you're in this situation, particularly if you have a chronic disease, talk to your family about it. Let them know that it's okay not to, um, not to do everything to save your life, that you lived a good life and that you're ready and that it's okay because whoever has to make that decision will feel better about it um, if they know that. I'll also just really quickly talk about COVID. Um, so many people have done um, living wills at my office and a huge question that we get, um, a living will will say, I don't wanna be put on a ventilator. Um, a living will, having a living will does not preclude you from getting a ventilator um, if you have COVID because the document is not triggered until a doctor says there's really no chance that you're gonna get it better. With COVID, we have people who go on ventilators and get back off of ventilators and they're okay. Um, and so just so you know, from that perspective, um, we got a lot of people calling our office saying, oh my gosh, do I need to update my living will? Because it says I don't want a ventilator. You don't have to update it, um, it is okay. Um, so I think that's important for people to think about. Um, the other thing that really bothers me about living wills, um, the old 1991 law that has not changed, um, talks about artificial hydration and nutrition as if they're the same thing. So if you have a form from 1991 that you've gotten in any hospital, it lumps together artificial hydration and nutrition. They're very different things. Um, I personally would not, like if I had end stage Alzheimer's, I wouldn't want to be too fed. I wouldn't want artificial nutrition. It's not like getting a hamburger at McDonald's, right? Um, but artificial hydration um, would be okay with me, particularly if it was to um, give me comfort in some way. Um, and so there's some things that, some diagnosis is that when we die, actually having some hydration makes us more comfortable as we pass. Um, my stepdad died of congestive heart failure and um, that was true in his situation. So really wanna think about those. Um, I don't think they should be lumped together. They're so different in IV versus tube feeding, very different. Um, so again, something you can look at your document um, and you know, think about, does it say what you want it to? Um, so, talked a little bit about this, who should be our agent. Um, so many people come into my office. I my aunt was like one of my hardest. She had six kids and I had to find a job for every kid. Not really what I would suggest that people do, um, but she was my aunt and she didn't listen to me, <laughs> but, um, please don't pick your oldest child or your local child. Pick the kid that's gonna be able to do the job. And I always say to my clients, if you're in a car accident tomorrow, who's coming to the hospital? Who's the kid that's gonna drop everything and be there? And maybe it's all your kids, or maybe you don't have kids and it's your niece or your friend. That's the person that you appoint. It is really that easy um, because they're the ones that are gonna be there. Too many times I see people um, choosing their oldest child because it's expected or the child that's local who maybe is not actually the most trustworthy. Please don't be bullied into this. This is one of the most important decisions that you can make. Um, if you, interestingly, if you wanna include all children, make them all your executor on your will. It's actually not that exciting of a job. Um, and, the law, and the law makes them do things. But an agent on a power of attorney has a lot of discretionary power and needs to make decisions maybe for a long time. So we need the best person here. Um, for some families, they're gonna choose one child for healthcare and one child for finances. So for instance, my oldest daughter, she's an accountant, lives in Boston. She has an Excel spreadsheet for everything. She would look at my organization and be aghast. Um, but she's definitely should be my financial power of attorney. Um, my youngest son, who's a, you know, a junior in high school, is interesting in nursing. 
So in medical field. So if he, he ends up doing that, maybe he would be the one later on that would make those decisions. So it doesn't have to be just one person. Um, if per people have an expertise in an area, I do think that that's sometimes something that we should consider. Also, they can do it jointly. Um, you can do it individually. You can do majority roles. Um, that's really up to your situation. What I tell my clients though is, you know, if your kids don't get along or whoever you're appointing don't get along, don't put them in this situation. They're not suddenly in a crisis situation going to learn how to communicate and be nice to each other. Um, then they're in my office and I wonder, why did you pick this person? Um, you pick the people who can get along. Um, and if you really, really want to make amends in a family and you really, really want these people to work together, then go to your law office, talk about it, and talk about what decisions you want made. So at my office, after we do a lot of um, our work, we many times will meet with the whole family together and say, these are the decisions that were made, these are why they were made, and this is what we expect out of you. It is not good to find out that situation and in the ICU waiting room. So, you know, think about, think about that. <clears throat> Someone who's trustable, responsible, and skilled. That's it. Um, and, uh, if, and if you don't have somebody who can make those decisions, um, you actually can, um, can appoint uh, a nonprofit, um, you know, particularly if we're dealing with a child who has special needs and maybe none of the family really is able to have that specialized knowledge, skilled knowledge, um, you can, you can uh, you can use a bank, you can, you know, there's other options that we can look into. <clears throat> so, you know, I, I kind of just talked about powers of attorneys, I know for a very long time, but my goal was to let you know that even if you have them, take them out, dust them off, look at them, uh, see if they were done before 2014. Look at who you appointed. Is that still who you'd want to appoint today? Um, you know, verify that you have successors named. Um, and if you're at all concerned, you know, um, you know, you can very welcome to go back to the law office that did them and ask them, what do they think about these? And, you know, how, how are your, how is your situation? So we think about planning life and death. You know, we talk about the financial power attorney, the healthcare, the living will, the mental health. They're all uh, for life um, during our life. The only one that we use during our life is a trust. And we're going to talk about trust and wills next. Um, so a will and a, and a trust. A, a will is only for after death. So whoever you name as your executor, they have no power until after you pass away. Um, and I'm just, I just saw the chat box come up. So I'm going to look... Um, I apologize, Suzanne. I just now saw what was the main items on the previous slide, um, and that was a while ago. No, we get we got it, Julie. Okay, good. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. So I just do want to stop here one second, um, and if anybody has any any questions before I kind of go on to wills and trusts, um, I'm happy to answer those questions. And Kyle, I do have because I don't have two screens. I'm having difficulty looking at the chat box. So yeah, yep, yep. I'm, I'm managing. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Um, anybody have any questions that we want to stop and take a deep breath about? Uh, here we got uh, one, Julie. Uh, do all these documents need to be notarized? That is a fantastic question. Um, no, to be honest with you, the financial power of attorney needs to be notarized. Um, only documents that we, we would record in a courthouse need to be notarized. So um, a financial power of attorney should be notarized if I'm ever going to use it to sell a house. But the rest of the documents I talked about don't need to be notarized. Each of them individually um, has requirements for um, witnesses. So a living will has to have two witnesses. And the witnesses cannot be the people that you're appointing. Um, so I would say for all the documents, the best practice would be to have two witnesses who are not people that you're appointing. Um, they must be 18. 
um, and not have a conflict. You know, if that's who you're appointing. So, <clears throat> good question. Any other questions? Feel free to type them in the chat box. And we'll also have time at the end. Yep. Up oh, here we. Two people who are not what, Julie? Um, who are not appointed in the documents. So like if I appoint my daughter Courtney, she then can't be my witness. Um, that would be considered to have a conflict of interest. So it's two people who don't have a conflict of interest. And really, the only person that really has a conflict of interest is somebody who's appointed. Any others right now? Uh, please, does financial power of, power of attorney need to be notarized? To clarify? Um, it, only, it only needs, no, the law does not require it. Uh, what is required is that um, if you ever use it, if the person ever uses it to sell a house. So if it's not notarized and the person who did the power of attorney becomes ill, is not able to sign for themselves, we would not be able to use it to sign a deed, but it would be able to be used on their places. Now I am gonna tell you that if it's not notarized, you might have trouble getting banks to um, accept it. So there's always a difference between legally what is absolutely required and then what best practices would be. I would really, I would really want a financial power attorney to be notarized. I think on their places. I remember, you know, remember when there used to be the seal with the notary, you'd send them out and they're like, there's no seal. It's like, well, they don't need to have a seal, um, but that's just what people are used to. All right, good. Well, we're gonna move on. I know there's some background noise. I don't know if anybody else is hearing that. I don't know. I'm not, not hearing it. Okay, well, maybe it's just on my end, as long as everybody else isn't. Good. All right, so moving on. Um, so last will and testament. Um, it's just a document that says, here's where my stuff goes. Um, and uh, we want to designate who's the executor. Um, for any of you who have minor children, the most important reason to do your will is to say, who gets the kids um, upon my death? Um, you know, who, who ends up, you know, being their testamentary guardians. Um, and so for most of my clients, they have a will, but we try not to use it. Uh, we try to use beneficiary designations. Um, we might use a trust because anything that goes through will goes through probate, which is not hoard in Pennsylvania, but it's also not wonderful. Um, there are fees that go with it and extra um, costs that go along with it. So, um, honestly, a will is a document that hasn't changed since I've become an attorney. Um, if you have an old will and it still says what you want it to say, it most likely does not need updated. What we'd want to spend more time on is making sure that things don't have to go through our will. So if we have life insurance or IRAs and they have beneficiaries, that those beneficiaries are who we want them to be. It is helpful, very helpful, if your will has two witnesses and a notary. That's what's called a self-proving will. It's then good in all 50 states. And I will tell you just this week, I had to admit a photocopy of a will to probate, and it took me three trips to the courthouse to do it in a situation where the family wasn't fighting. You can have county by county differences, um, but it would be important to have two witnesses and a notary. If the witnesses aren't there, I, or the witnesses don't sign twice, I actually have to go find those people. Like in my situation, the notary was, had passed away. So, um, but um, generally I'm gonna tell you that your will is probably does not need updated unless what you want um, has changed. One of the biggest changes that we see for people who um, are in the second half of life is they might have what I call an I love you will. You know, I love you so much, I give you, I give my spouse everything. Um, and you really wanna consider an I love you but will. And what that means is I love you so much, you can have everything, but 
if you're in a nursing home when I pass away, I might want the money to go there towards that care, but I also might want some of it to go down to my children or whoever my other beneficiaries are. Pennsylvania law allows us to give one third to the spouse who's in a nursing home to pay for their care and two thirds can go down to the children if we have that wording in our will. Um, that's, a, that's a personal choice, um, how you feel about that. Um, but that's something that we would want to think about. It's called a bypass clause um, in your will. <clears throat> I've talked a lot about this already, that we want beneficiary designations. So annuities, life insurance, IRA, we want to make sure that they have a beneficiary. And most all the time, uh, we definitely want that to go to um, a named person. There are times that we do want some money within the estate to pay expenses. Um, that's why we have to look at the total situation. <clears throat> um, some people call them beneficiaries. Here, the next uh, point talks about transfer on death, TOD designations. Um, we also can title accounts. So we can have a joint tenants um, account. That means it goes there. When we look at real estate, we always need to go, I know I get a lot of situations where, you know, three brothers own a cabin together. Well, I need to know if the deed is tenants in common, which means in each brother's situation, their share is gonna go to their family, or joint tenancy, which means in each of those situations, if one brother dies, the other brothers receive it. Um, and I interact with a lot of people who have you know, these cabins or hunting camps or just an old farm um, and they don't actually know what it is. Um, first, we have to find out what it is. And then two, is that what everybody wanted? Because sometimes I find old deeds and it's not actually what everybody wanted. Um, and then we, we need to talk about that. And if you have any of these types of accounts, particularly if you're um, you know, older and your siblings are older, Remember, if any one of the siblings needs nursing home care, that cabin or that property can be available for care. And so sometimes we want to do planning around, well, what happens if any of us get sick? Um, or if there's people that don't use this and they don't want it, should we, we buy it out or, you know, simplify, you know, figure out what needs to happen with it. So real estate, um, we need to really look at the deed to see who it goes to and how it passes. <clears throat> and Julie, when you mentioned uh, self-proving will, can you kind of explain uh, what, what is a self-proving will? Absolutely. So a self-proving will is when we have two witnesses, a notary, and the two witnesses sign the document twice, and so does the testator, who means it's the person whose will it is. So if, I, if it was my will, I would sign it twice. Um, the witnesses would sign it twice. Um, and what's happening there is we're first witnessing my signature. The witnesses are first saying, yes, I saw this person sign it. They're then saying, <clears throat> yes, I signed this. Um, and then they're notarizing both things. So important, a self-proving will, I'm going to see the two witnesses signing it twice and the testator also signing it twice. <clears throat> The other thing that we want to think about is, you know, what has happened within our lives? Has there been a death, um, you know, a, a, a divorce, um, any type of illness? So we want to think about, um, you know, if I want to give everything to my three children, um, but, you know, maybe my daughter marries somebody who um, I'm a little bit concerned about. Um, do I really want her to receive it all? Do I want her to receive it within a trust? Um, what happens, um, you know, if um, I'm going to give it to one of my children and they end up, you know, getting an illness um, and might need benefits later on, you know, how do I feel about that? And there's no right or wrong, but many times we want to accentuate, um, <clears throat> particularly in a situation where we have a situation where um, somebody is already on public benefits. So let's say that we have a beneficiary. I'll use myself. Let's say um, I have a child who lives with me, has Down syndrome, 
is what is you know, called an adult dependent child. Um, I could give money to that child in my will just outright. I could give it in a trust where somebody else is the trustee to help spend that money. I also could give it in a trust called a special needs trust. And that type of trust allows that child who has a special needs to receive, continue to receive their benefits. Now, some people may say, well, I would want my money to be used so they don't have to receive public benefits. Here's the really hard part of that. Sometimes people receive public benefits and if they get an inheritance and they get kicked off their program, when the money's gone, it's hard to get them back on that program because their spot may have been filled. There might be a waiting list. And that's the reality of public benefits in our state right now. Um, so I urge people um, to really kind of think through um, because we don't want a small inheritance or a larger one displacing them in their daily routine and their programs. Um, so that issue is larger than money. It's also access to benefits and programs. Um, so comprehensive pl planning. Um, interestingly, uh, Wayne talked about this is um, the legacy committee. Um, it is creating a legacy. What do we want to do with this? Is it, is it just about giving everything to our three kids equally? Um, or is there more than that? Um, and for many families, it is a lot more than that. Um, it's about other things that were important in their life. Um, and also taking a step back. I have many families who take a step back and say, there's a certain amount of money their kids can have, but above that, they don't need it, or they don't feel like it's beneficial. And maybe there's other places, um, whether it's the church or whether it's another nonprofit that people are passionate about. It is important to give thought to that and to think about that. Um, but comprehensive estate planning also talks about well, what happens if I get sick for a short period of time? Uh, long-term care, what happens if it's a long period of time? Um, and what happens if I pass away? And creating a legacy, one of the biggest things here that I think is really important is if you're gonna do it, let's do it in the best manner possible. So often we do wanna give from IRAs, 401ks, from what we call qualified money. So again, using my situation, I have three kids. I could say if I die tomorrow, let's say my husband had already died, everything goes equally amongst my three kids. Some people will then say, but the first 10% goes to my church. Um, we actually don't wanna do that. Um, not that we don't wanna give the 10% to the church, but then what happens is um, they get 10% of everything. My children end up with less money because they, they get 90% of the IRAs and that's all taxable. So what we like to do a lot of times is to say, well, really, how much do you want to give to that nonprofit or church? Um, and should we use the money out of this IRA, 401k, or annuity that has tax um, hindrances, but won't for the church, won't for that nonprofit? So as an example, if I have $100,000 in an IRA and that pays out to my kids, when they get that money, they have to put that on their, their income tax return. They have to pay tax on that money if it hasn't already been taxed. Now, not so much with a Roth IRA, but traditional IRAs, 401ks or annuities where there's um, not a big basis in it. We, um, if we gave, and so let's say that I gave that $100,000 to my kids and until they paid tax, they ended up with $70,000. If I give $100,000 out of my IRA to my church or nonprofit, they get $100,000. There's no tax due on that. And so um, I, this is something when we think about comprehensive estate planning, we don't just want in a will where your attorney says $5,000 to my church or 10% or something like that. We actually want to think about what are the assets that we really want to give the church or the nonprofit that make, gives us the biggest bang for our buck, if you will. Now, Sometimes what happens is we say, well, we want this IRA to go, and then we use the IRA. So we certainly can put language in our, in our will that ensures that there's a certain amount that would go to that, that thing that was important to us, whatever that is. Um, 
But I find a lot of attorneys don't take the time to think about your individual assets and the tax consequences um, of them. And you really do want to do that. As long as you're going to make that gift, you really do want to think about that. Also, we do a lot of trust work um, and designations, and we also may want to think about very specifically, particularly when we're creating a legacy, what is that legacy that we want to create? Um, you know, again, if I give it to my church, I can just give it outright to my church. If I give it to a nonprofit, let's say the YWCA who helps, you know, battered women, I can just give the money and it's up to them how to spend it. But for some people, um, they're very passionate about one part of that mission. Maybe they're very passionate about children. Um, maybe they're very passionate about um, outreach. And so you also can leave gifts that really do create a legacy because they could be restricted or given to a certain part of that mission. Um, so I know that I um, dealt with a family where um, their loved one, it was really important to them that children continued going to Sunday school or uh, whatever um, that instructions called um, within that church. And so they wanted to give money to make sure that that was always available in whatever form that it was. So um, when we think about creating a legacy and we think about charitable gifting, we need to think about what type of assets are we giving them? We should always give them the most taxed assets because they're not going to pay tax on it. We also want to think about, is this just a blanket gift? And we will just trust the people that are in charge to do whatever is needed. And that's fine. But some people would say, no, I really want it to go to a certain thing. Um, and so we can do that. Um, we also, you know, use charitable remainder trusts um, at our office. We do quite a bit of work with this. Charitable remainder trusts are a lot of fun um, because you can do them during life and maybe get even your children or grandchildren involved in picking out the charities each year. Um, there's two types of charitable trusts. One's a charitable lead trust where we lead with it. And that means that the charity gets the money in the beginning <clears throat> and the family or whoever gets it at the end. A remainder trust means, um, let's say I have, you know, a million dollars and I put it in a charitable remainder trust for the rest of my life. I get income off of that. Um, when I die, um, the remainder goes to my charity, my church. Um, <clears throat> charitable remainder trusts are very um, important. Um, given the new tax law called the SECURE Act, um, which made it so that people have to pay out their IRAs in 10 years to their children. So if you have more qualified money, um, IRAs, 401ks, um, any type of pension program where it's going to pay out and be taxed, um, what used to happen under the old law, I could give it to my daughter and she could take it out across her lifespan. The new law called the SECURE Act says it has to come out in 10 years. That's going to cause her more tax when it comes out because it's going to come out in a shorter period of time. And so because of that, many people are choosing to take their IRAs, 401ks, and set it up into a charitable remainder trust where uh, they get the money the rest of their life or their children and the remainder goes to um, whoever their beneficiaries are. So I did one of those um, recently with a church in Williamsport, a family um, created a charitable remainder trust. And um, it's really kind of fun because that, in that situation, very specifically, the person who passed away wanted the money to be used to help um, part of the mission of the church was, which was to help, you know, social, social justice needs um, and needs of particular individuals in the community who may be dealing with homelessness or other types of things. So it's a pool of money that that church has um, and their local, their, their then existing finance committee gets to decide where the money goes. It's a really a lovely situation though too, because 
the man who passed away, his children also sit on that. And so as part of, you know, he was an extremely, extremely charitable man. And part of his legacy is continuing that on um, with having his kids be involved. Um, and I have to tell you, I've watched his kids um, go from being not participatory in those types of things to being very, very engaged in it. Um, and so, um, you know, those time, you know, sometimes what you need to do is talk about your specific situation and see if it makes sense. For some people, it will make sense just making a gift um, with the restrictions that they want. For other people, um, because of tax purposes, it would make sense to use some sort of a charitable trust. On the slide, we have charitable remainder trust, and that's because that's been made more popular with the SECURE Act. Um, but during my career, I've done a lot of charitable lead trusts, and I like the lead trust also because it allows the families to be involved uh, during that lead period. Um, some of that has to do with, you know, sometimes we're using charitable trusts to avoid income tax. What I will tell you is at the end of the day, the tax money that would have went to the government is often pretty, pretty similar to what ends up going to the charity. Um, and your beneficiaries pretty much get the same amount. Um, you, I mean, you can set them up that way, depending on what, what your goal is um, in that situation. Hey, Julie. Uh, yes. When, when you were talking about uh, some assets are more qualified. Yes. Um, can you kind of explain what you mean there? Yeah, absolutely. So qualified money is money that we haven't paid tax on. And when we take it out, we will. So IRAs are qualified money if they're not a Roth. That means that if I have a $100,000 IRA and I take out 10,000, that $10,000 is going on my tax return. So many of you have those types of assets and right now, when you take out money, you pay tax. Same thing happens with your children when they inherit it. They don't pay the tax all at once, but when they remove the money, um, they have to pay tax on it. Um, and, um, and, the, and the law has required them to take, take it out in a lesser period of time, which will overall increase the tax. So qualified money, IRA money, 401k money, um, but also there can be qualified annuities. Um, and those types of annuities mean that they have more income tax inside of them. Um, qualified means whenever I'm gonna pull money out of there, I'm gonna pay income tax on it. Um, and again, the reason that's important is I say, I'm gonna pay income tax on it. So are you guys gonna pay income tax on it? So are your children, but your charity or church is not going to. And if you think about that, that leverages our dollars so much more um, so that more, you know, more money can be made out of it um, for that. And I, too, Julie, real quick, um, I know we're going to, you're going to talk some more about trust. Um, yeah. But what's, what's your view on living trust? Is mm -hmm. it a good spot to throw that in? Yeah. Okay. Yep. I do see um, one other question. Um, yeah, what I'm talking about, a Roth IRA would not be qualified. You would have already paid the tax on that. Um, a living trust is just a trust that I make uh, during my life um, while I'm living. Um, most people, when they say living trust, mean a revocable living trust, which means I can um, take it away. We are gonna talk about that. Revocable living trusts are used as a will substitute. Um, they're used to avoid probate. Typically, um, we, we have other goals when we do that, whether that's um, figuring out uh, the distribution, you know, maybe I give it to my kids, but they have to take it out, you know, 10% a year over 10 years, so it stretches it out. Um, or maybe I'm using a living trust because um, I want all the money to go to my daughter and I don't want her spouse to get it if they get divorced. Um, but a living trust just means I make it during, a, during my life um, and um, it will always survive my death. The most common reason to do that is to avoid probate. Um, you can give money. One of the questions we get all the time is, can I just give money to my children? You absolutely can. Just know that when you give money to children, um, there is a penalty period. Um, if you go into a nursing home and need medical assistance. 
Um, and so um, for every month, um, there's a penalty for every $10,000 gifted. So what happens if you go into a nursing home and you run out of money, they say, have you given any money away in the last five years? And if you have, they assess a penalty. Um, so if I give away $100,000, they're going to take that and divide it by the $10,000, 723 that you see on the screen, come out with about 10 months. And they're going to say that I, I won't pay for your care for 10 months. This is really important because if you give gifts to children, you should do it under the advice of an attorney who understands these types of rules so that you don't run out of money and then they penalize you. Um, and five years is a long look back. None of us know, you know where we're gonna be five years from now and what our health is gonna be. Um, goodness, we would have never thought we'd be in 2020 a year ago, uh, you know, where we're at. So important to understand. I'm not a big lover of outright gifts to ch children. Um, you know, some people say, oh, I'll give my house to my kids to hold it um, so that it doesn't have to be used for nursing home care. But remember um, the four Ds, your child could get divorced, in which case your house is part of that divorce settlement. The child could go into debt, uh, you know, and maybe it's not even their fault. Maybe they became disabled. Maybe they have a spouse that has a spending problem. Um, maybe, unfortunately, um, you know, they lost their job. Um, your child should also become disabled or your child could die. So, you know, one of the biggest reasons that we want to use trust is we want to use trust to put assets in there um, to protect them to go to the next generation once we're completely done with them. So the best example is, you know, should I give my kids my house for a dollar? Um, you know, should I just gift my house to my kids? And the answer to that is no, um, because, you know, if you give it to your kids and then they go through an ugly divorce, that house is part of that divorce settlement. Um, if your child becomes disabled and they need care, that house is available for their care. If you want to protect assets from the cost of long-term care or get them to your children for some reason, you should use a trust because the trust will protect against divorce, debt, disability. A trust is a really neat thing because it allows you, you know, if I put my, your house into what's called a protector trust, you can still be your own trustee, you can make decisions about it, uh, but it protects it from being used from nursing home care, protects your spouse, and upon your death, it goes to who you want it to. So when we talk about trust, you know, I, I think you're probably getting the idea that, you know, I always think about if I say I have a trust, it's like saying I have a car. You don't really know what it is. A trust is a very generic term. Um, really, a trust is just a written set of instructions, you know, so you don't know. You know, if I tell you I have a car, you don't know if I have a little Jeep or, you know, a Suburban or a little Subaru. Um, and so we're going to talk about trust to kind of get a little bit more, um, more understanding of it. So we think about the trust, you think about the vehicle itself, um, the assets that we fund the trust, you can think about like the gasoline I put into, we can put really put anything into it. Um, you know, who's the driver of the car, um, that's who our trustee is going to be. So in all of these situations, when you think about using trust, you know, the type of trust can be different, the vehicle can be different. Um, the type of, you know, a, a, uh, assets that we put in the trust um, can be different. Um, but we have to get the gasoline in. We got to get the assets in um, or else it's not helpful. And sometimes you go to law offices that set you up a trust, but they won't um, fund it for you or they give you instructions for you to do it yourself. I feel like that's like me taking my car um, to the service center and them handing me the brakes with the instructions. Like, I think I'm smart enough. I could probably figure it out over like two weeks. Um, but um, what we want to do is we need, you know, need to make sure that the deed gets changed, the beneficiaries get changed, so that that is controlled by the trust. Too many times people pass away and they have a trust and it was never funded and the beneficiaries were never changed, so it's useless. Um, so, you, you know, just like a car is useless without gas, really important. And this is something that if you have a trust, you should really think about, well, was it ever really funded? Did I change the beneficiaries? So sometimes, you know, I work with families that they already have a trust and that, that revocable living trust will work, 
we just have to use it. We just have to change the beneficiaries so they go there. Um, we just have to make sure that we're getting the most out of it that we possibly can. So what are common objections for the trust? I've already talked about avoidance for probate. Um, I don't often at my office do a revocable living trust for somebody if that's the only goal, because usually I can avoid most probate other ways. Um, but many people want other things like protection for the cost of long-term care. You know, what happens if I go into a nursing home? How do I protect my spouse? Um, controlled gifting, you know, um, should my children get it all at once? So in my estate plan, um, it doesn't all go out to my kids immediately. They get part of it when they're 27. They get another part of it when they're 30 and another part of it when they're 33. Uh, so that's controlled gifting. I'm controlling um, when they get it and how they get it. So I figure, you know, if they go out and blow the first third, maybe they're smarter by the second third. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, for me, I do have clients who come in and they want to control it for forever. I don't know. I think there's children that can develop and mature. And then there's at some point in time, this is what we have. And so, um, but I have people who make it so, you know, it's not really available until that child retires. Um, I have people who say they can have as much as what their W-2 says. So if a child goes out and works and makes $30,000, they can get $30,000 from the trust. All of that depends on, you know, back to your legacy and what's your goal. And some of you may say, I don't care. I'm gone. And that's okay to wait. You know, I, it's not for me to tell you how to feel and what's important. It's for you to decide that and then make sure that your plan expresses that. We also do worry about federal estate taxes. Now we are going to go over that. That's only um, for those people who have more than $11 million. And I imagine that most of us on here don't have $11 million. But it's something that we want to look at because we don't know with the next presidency and with all the spending um, that has been done, what will happen to that. Um, so when I started my career, the exclusion was $600,000. It wasn't that long ago that it was $3 million. And it's not hard to get to 3 million with, you know, remember that we include all the value of all real estate, the value of all life insurance. Um, and so um, that's something we always wanna look at. A beneficiary who has supplemental needs, I've talked about special needs. Um, those words can really be interchangeable, whether you talk about special needs or supplemental needs. The management of assets upon death. So do you need a trust? The question is, is there a goal that we can accomplish with it? Um, you know, uh, again, you know, outlaw protection. Uh, I want this to go to my daughter, but not to be um, got in a divorce by my son-in-law. Really important one. <clears throat> These types of trusts, I'm not going to get into them just in the amount of time that we have. I want to make sure we have time for questions. Just know, like the question about a living trust, all of these are living trusts. Um, they're just different parts of it. The biggest issue too is that people think a revocable trust or irrevocable, um, that, that they're just like two options. Really, most trusts are shades of them. So there's some trusts that are really, really irrevocable, uh, meaning that I can't change anything. And there's trusts that are really, really revocable, which means I can change anything I want. When we do trust for um, protecting against the cost of nursing home care, it's kind of in the middle. There's some things you can change and some things that you can't. And I'm going to go through this because it's not, again, with time. I want to make sure that we have. So grantor versus non-grantor, that's just a tax thing. Um, and it's the biggest objection we get from financial advisors is that you can't do this um, because um, you have to get an EIN number or it'll mess up the taxes. Most of the trusts I use at my office are grantor trusts. And those tr that means that um, the grantor um, it's their taxation. And so there's, it's not complicated. Um, revocable versus irrevocable, as I talked about, it's really a continuum. Um, and you have to talk about that specific trust to see what powers you still have. So, you know, an irrevocable trust that we use for nursing home care, the trustees can still be the um, older people. Um, so they still have, comp they still have so much control. Um, it seems like a misnomer you know, in that situation. 
What taxes do we consider? Um, the biggest taxes for us is Pennsylvania inheritance tax. Um, there's zero percent tax to spouses. I will tell you when I started my career in the early 1990s, there was tax between spouse and Pennsylvania. That was like the biggest, you know, there I was this young attorney and I had to tell people, oh, you have to pay tax. They hated it. Um, but interestingly, they haven't taken away in Pennsylvania. They just say the tax rate is zero. But the tax that we see the most is to children. It's four and a half percent, 12 percent to siblings and 15 percent to other heirs, which unfortunately includes nieces and nephews. Um, and so one of the things we want to think about. So this is if you pass away and you give money to your children, they're going to pay a four and a half percent tax on everything that passes to them but life insurance in our state. I will tell you there's not a huge amount you can do about this without gifting and giving up complete control. Um, and for most of you, you don't want to do that. You need to stay in control. You don't know what life puts to you. The other thing is that uh, sometimes people gift things like houses, <laughs> which I already told you I don't think people should do. Well, one of the other reasons that I don't think people should do it is if I gift my house to my child, let's say I gift my house to my child, Courtney, when she, pa when she, um, when she won't pay the four and a half percent inheritance tax, but when she sells it, she's going to pay a capital gains tax. If I hold on to my house or I have my house in a trust and it goes to Courtney, my daughter, upon my death, um, she will pay the four and a half percent inheritance tax but when she sells it, she won't pay capital gains tax. And if you've owned your home for a long time, the capital gains tax is gonna be worse. So sometimes, again, when people gift to children, it's a little short-sighted because there's a worse tax down the road. Um, that's why you really need to work with an attorney who understands income tax and not just these um, state transfer taxes. Um, the other thing that there's out there, um, most of us know about this, uh, are conscious, they don't, you know, we're not conscious of it, but we do kind of know about it, is a Pennsylvania Realty transfer tax, which is a 2% tax on the transfer. So every time you've ever bought a house, you pay 1% and the sellers pay 1%. Um, that comes up in this situation. Um, if we're going to transfer real estate, um, the problem in Pennsylvania is that children are exempt for this, stepchildren are exempt from this, um, but not step-grandchildren which is really hard. So we have to think through all of that. <clears throat> I talked about the federal estate tax being $11 million as the exclusion. So if you don't have $11 million, you don't have to worry about this. Um, and many people think or know that they can give up to $10,000 a year to their children. It's actually 15,000. It was 10,000 for many years. But unless you're close to the $11 million, you don't have to worry about that. The only thing you worry about is if you go into a nursing home and you need care that I talked about before, the $10,000 divisor. <clears throat> um, there's also, we worry about, you know, the healthcare surtax. So if you have a business um, and you have to liquidate it because you got sick, we also will end up paying that extra 3.8% healthcare surtax, which is why we like to liquidate things over a series of years if we can. <clears throat> so taxes are definitely a consideration in all of this. Um, we should first figure out our goals and then we should apply, you know, what's the best tax way to achieve that. That's my job. Um, so if you come and tell me your goals, that's my job is to figure out the best way to do that. Um, a lot of times people ask about wills versus trusts. Um, as I talked to you about, many people do need a simple will. It says this is where I want it to go. Um, the inheritance tax, the four and a half percent, typically is going to be the same whether you use a will or a trust. It's about whether or not you had control. If I have a will, I am going to pay a probate fee. If I have a trust, I'm going to avoid that probate fee. It's not a huge amount. We're talking about hundreds of dollars, not thousands for most people. Attorney's fees, um, for, um, for many law offices, they do a simple will um, and then they charge a percentage of the estate when you pass away. 
Um, at our office, we really look at what work is involved. So when we have clients who come up and they have a really good comprehensive plan and we've figured out what's the best way, um, the attorney's fees are often a lot less when somebody dies. And that's because they, they did a lot of it during their life. And that's helpful, not just to reduce those fees, um, but also it's easier to work with the person who knows the answer to the question. So if you take your time, no matter what law firm, to get it all organized, um, it's gonna take less time than us guessing. You know, again, I have a house that we're going through right now. I sent a brother into a house to say, just find me any paperwork you can. And my office is going through that paperwork, trying to figure out what assets are out there so we don't miss one. You know, we're writing letters to banks just to say, hey, did this guy have any money here? Because we don't know. Um, that's very inefficient um, and costly. There is an executor's fees and a trust fee fees. Most in my work, most um, families do not take those fees. If you take the fee, like so if my daughter Courtney took an executor's fee, um, she has to pay income tax on it. And if she just inherits the money, she doesn't pay any income tax on it. So, you know, I started my career, everybody took a fee. I'd have to say now it's, it's um, a little bit unusual for people to do that. Um, wills are definitely more easily able to be contested than trusts. Um, and that's just because of the legal mechanism. Um, if a will is contested, um, it can very much be held up. Um, a trust because it's a living trust, you know, because it's often made during life and it already is valid and in, in, in use. Um, it's just not as easy to um, contest it. If you're really worried about that, you can um, consider what's, what's called an in-territorium clause. And that means that in a will, it says, you know, if anybody contests this, and they're unsuccessful, they lose whatever they were supposed to get in the will. Um, and so if I, if I argue against it that I didn't get enough and I lose, I get nothing. So I actually kind of like those clauses. Uh, I like it. I don't like people arguing that they need to get more after their parents die. Um, so, you know, a lot of people ask, you know, what happens if I don't do this planning? Can you still protect things? Yes. In a crisis situation, we still are able to help families protect assets from the cost of long-term care, make sure the spouse at home isn't going to be left financially destitute. Um, it just takes longer um, and is more difficult. Um, and I think also gives us a little bit more angst, like are we really doing what this person wanted us to do? So. So we think about the process just to kind of overall for those of us that you know either are younger or have children that are younger. Um, the way we usually start out is powers of attorneys, advanced directives, wills, um, a children's trust, you know, so just a kind of basic uh, estate plan foundation. And that may be what you have from many years ago. Um, the biggest thing again with that is who is the testamentary guardian of any minor children really important. Um, the middle years, the accumulation years, um, we would want all of those things, but that one we really think about well, what happens if we have a beneficiary who has a special need? Uh, what happens if we get into uh, needing nursing home care? Um, you know, what, where are we at? And it's definitely that we want to talk with an attorney and a financial advisor together to say, you know, are we on track for as we accumulate this money? Um, for what we want in our retirement or um, later in life. Um, and so we would add some trust in those years um, for many people, um, not everybody. We get into pre-retirement years. Um, that's when we really think about, you know, more trust for um, our IRAs or our protector, um, trust for our house to protect against the cost of long-term care, particularly so that our spouse um, gets to keep it. Um, but we also, and I didn't talk about this, but, you know, I'm also a big believer that that's when we think about, you know, long-term care insurance or life insurance with a long-term care rider. Um, and I find in our local area, the people who sell that may not know enough about the different options. Um, so one of the things that we do is help clients. Um, we as a law firm cannot sell those products, um, but we do understand a lot about the income tax consequences and how it fits into your overall estate plan. Um, and I definitely, there's some of them, I think there's some wonderful creative financial solutions out there um, that can help protect against what happens if I get sick. 
Um, and we want to do that when our health is still good. Um, so we could get life insurance with a long-term care rider. We could take some of our money in an IRA and create a pool of money for long-term care. Um, for each person, it's going to be very individual, uh, but that's a process that you want to go through. And you definitely want to go through with it with somebody who specializes and works with long-term care. Um, so if your advisor doesn't know a lot about that, may not be the best person. Your financial advisor is always really good at helping you make your money grow, but they're not always good at protecting it or understanding this long-term care. Now, they may work with a specialist, which is great, but it is a situation where you want somebody who really specializes in it and knows the different products that are out there. Um, once we've retired, uh, we want to make sure it's all up to date. And that it all makes sense and that it's not something, you know, with something we want to review and look at again um, and see if there's any, any more things that we want to add. For some people, we're not going to add anything else. Um, for some people, we're going to be a little bit more aggressive on protecting assets, um, particularly if we get a diagnosis. So I always think about... You know, if we go back to the car example, you know, sometimes, you know, we want to want to create an estate plan or, or buy a car. Um, but please know, you know, if you buy a car, you're going to get the oil change, you're going to update it, they're going to make small changes to it. Same is true um, with an estate plan. Um, a lot of times clients come to me on a review and they don't have to redo everything, but we might look at it differently. We might put more assets into the trust. Um, we might, might um, I have work with families who get inheritances from other family members, like what do we do now? Um, also work with families who maybe a child they thought was going to be a good decision maker, but unfortunately something happens to that relationship. Um, you need to update this to make sure. So at our office, um, we have a team of professionals um, that really we focus just on these, these questions that we're dealing with. We really do like to do individualized planning. Um, and our goal is to give you quality documents that give you peace of mind. During COVID, we are doing mostly Zoom or um, initial consultations by appointment. You are welcome to come into our office, but we really believe we can give you the same face-to-face -face service, um, even if it's via Zoom and not in office meeting. Um, and for everybody, I would say again, even if you, what, one of the things I'm hearing from a lot of people is like, oh, I'll wait until this is over. Yeah, something could happen to you. So again, I urge you, if you already have an estate plan in a law office, you know, call them. Um, it might be a great time to set up a Zoom meeting. You can eat your breakfast and, you know, Zoom with your attorney um, and review your documents. It's just a great time, I think, for us all to get this in order organization. The one thing I would say, and you know, there's a lot of great questions about witnesses and notaries. Um, we still do our, our signings in, in um, person at our office. There is such a thing in Pennsylvania as a virtual notary, but it's just not easy to use. Um, and so we, um, we do as much social distancing as possible. We go over the documents ahead of time. We have had the window open. I'm not sure what we're gonna do in February, but <laughs> we'll figure that out uh, going forward. Um, at our office, we do require social distancing and we are following the mandates of the mass requiring um, and, you know, taking all the precautions that is requested of us as a business. And I think most um, law firms are, I know I've, I've done a lot of Zooms um, trying to help that. So um, you're welcome to contact us. Um, happy to, we do offer free initial consultations. Also on here um, is our website. We do have a load of information on there that you're welcome to access. Again, my goal is to help you get informed so you feel comfortable with the decisions um, that you're making. You can stay connected with us, Facebook, YouTube. As Kyle mentioned, we do have a Second Half of Life podcast. Um, some parts of this could be uh, used for that podcast, um, you know, the parts that I'm talking on. Um, <clears throat> if you want to access that, you can get it on, on Apple, Spotify, TuneIn plus Alexa, iHeartRadio, um, or again, you can just get on our website uh, to access our podcast. 
So, you know, I talked about a lot of different things. Today was about basics. So for instance, I talked about special needs planning. If you have a child who has special needs, there's podcasts on there that go more in depth just about that. Um, and really helpful because they're specific to Pennsylvania law. Also, if you would like a copy of any of the books um, that we talked about today, um, Kyle's happy to send them to you.